Continuing our discourse around health, we have a distinguished panel up next that will discuss building resilience in India's primary healthcare system and the critical shifts and partnerships required to achieve the SDG of affordable and inclusive healthcare by 2030. To moderate this panel, I have the privilege of inviting Dr. Sanjeev Arora. Dr. Arora is the founder and director of Project ECHO, uh, a nonprofit that uses technology, a disease management model, case-based learning, and a web-based database to arm primary care providers with the knowledge needed to treat those with complex health problems that would otherwise need to travel for medical care. ECHO currently operates with hubs in 39 countries and spokes in over 125 countries. Dr. Arora is also a distinguished and regents professor of medicine with tenure in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of New Mexico Health Services Sciences Center. Warm welcome, Dr. Arora, and I hand it over to you for the next 45 minutes. Thank you, Santosh, and um, thank you, uh, Ms. Sudha Srinivasan, for this kind uh, opportunity to, to present here and also uh, to moderate this panel. You know, I'm a gastroenterologist by profession, and I left India 40 years ago, and it's been wonderful to see the gradual improvement in healthcare in India. About 17 years ago, I started um, Project ECHO in the United States to solve a particular problem that people were dying because of a lack of specialty access in the country. In my own clinic, I had an um, eight month wait to see me and um, people were dying from liver cancers and liver failure because they couldn't get treatment for hepatitis C. So I, I developed ECHO with the idea and our mission to exponentially expand the capacity of a health system to implement best practices all over the world. And the way the ECHO model worked was that we would use one to many video conferencing like we are using today uh, to leverage the expertise of a multidisciplinary team of experts. And um, we would share best practices, protocols, guidelines with primary care clinicians. And then they would present patients to each other and to us at the university. And we would build communities of practice. And what we found was over time, these primary care clinicians became experts and waits in my clinic fell from eight months to two weeks. Since then, we have now expanded the ECHO project from hepatitis C to more than 70 different disease areas in 158 countries. We have uh, partnered with the Honorable uh, Secretary Preeti Sudhan uh, in India and have uh, launched almost 50 networks in India, including um, our work in India on COVID-19 has involved the training of 300,000 healthcare workers on best practices in COVID-19, which have uh, included nurses and doctors and public health professionals, etc. And in the last 12 months, have done 66 million minutes of training in India. But going back to the more general, what we have found across the world is that there's an enormous shortage of skilled healthcare workers in every country that we work in. Even in the United States, where we have almost twice the specialists than any other developed nation, and almost 50 times that in countries, in some countries in Africa, our rural clinicians, our rural patients don't have access to specialists easily. Our low income patients cannot find specialists. Primary care is difficult to find. So over the last few years, there's been a quantum improvement in healthcare in India because of the Ayushman Bharat project, which we will hear about in a, in a moment uh, from Mr. Indu Bhushan. One of the challenge, the insurance arm of, of this project has, of course, relieved a lot of suffering for humanity, and many, many visits have occurred. Yet there remains a challenge of healthcare workers shortage, skills of healthcare workers. And we know that the right knowledge cannot, uh, the right care cannot be provided unless the right knowledge exists at the right place at the right time. So 
in our work around the world, we have found countries taking three primary approaches for the purpose of uh, overcoming healthcare resource shortages. First is, of course, you can take the approach of making a lot more doctors, more medical schools, make nurses, more nurses. This takes a lot of time, but has enduring benefits. Another approach they've taken is the allowing mid-level providers from barefoot doctors in China many decades ago to nurse practitioners and physician assistants. The approach we have taken around the world is there is existing workforce, why not upskill them? That is primarily the, the way ECHO works. We find when a nurse has a repertoire of working on, on a license allows one to 10 level of work, most of them work at three and four because they don't have the, they don't have the skills. And so ECHO has taken the approach of upskilling them, building communities of practice in which all teach and all learn. I want to now move on to our panel and introduce our, um, our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Indu Bhushan is of course well known to all of you. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Ayushman Bharat. This is the Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana of the National Health Authority, the world's largest government-funded health insurance scheme, providing cashless secondary and tertiary care to more than 53 crore poorest citizens. He's a civil ser servant turned economist with a career spanning nearly 37 years. He has had multiple positions with the Asian Development Bank, including as Director General Strategy and Policy Development. He was awarded the Government of India's National Award for E-Governance 2019-20, the Gold Award on behalf of the National Health Authority, and also the Global Achievement Award by Johns Hopkins University, his alma mater. Please welcome uh, Dr. Indu Bhushan, and um, Dr. Bhushan, you will have six minutes to speak. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Rula, and thank you very much for inviting me here. And of course, uh, this uh, crisis uh, pandemic has been a huge tragedy for the country, for the whole world. Uh, but in this perspective, I want to make three points. Uh, first, while the strategy, tragedy has been there, it has also thrown up some opportunities. And one opportunity is that health sector has become the center of debate in policy in discussions. Earlier, health sector was on the periphery of uh, development debates. Now, for last six months, uh, I've never seen that health uh, is being uh, seen in discussions in the PMO, cabinet secretary, and uh, all different ministries. So when we were saying earlier that uh, health is everyone's concern, probably the first time all ministries are working on health sector. Uh, for the first time, we are seeing health sector issues being reported on the front page of all newspapers for a long time. So this is an opportunity that we need to seize, where we can put in place long-term reforms and changes in the sector, which will help us come out of this crisis better and stronger, number one. Number two, uh, this crisis also has shown the fault lines where we have not done well. And I think uh, that also points to where those changes uh, need to be made. And some of those issues are that we need to do more for urban health. We need to do more for digital health. We need to do more in public, uh, public health and all these areas which have not received the kind of attention we should have given in the past, uh, have come back to, uh, are showing us the mirror that probably these are the areas we need to work more on. Third, and I think uh, this is a positive uh, uh, message, that many of the initiatives that government has taken in recently have also helped in a big way in responding to the crisis. And I'll focus on only the scheme that I, uh, I supervise or coordinate uh, Ayushman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Janarukhi Yojana. And this has helped in terms of responding to the crisis in a big way and showing that uh, schemes like this can build the resilience that we need in the health sector. And I'll just uh, uh, share with you five areas where the scheme has helped in doing that. Number one, it has helped in terms of uh, protecting the poor uh, from COVID and non-COVID, both uh, uh, diseases. 
uh, during the last six months. Uh, we have provided through this scheme uh, support for 70,000 tests and more than close to about 25,000 treatments. And these are to the people who have taken this uh, treatment and test, the private sector, uh, they wouldn't have uh, been able to afford it. Second is that the scheme also has been able to crowd in support from the private sector in a big, big way uh, in terms of uh, uh, providing help, uh, especially for the non-COVID. Uh, what happened uh, in the past six months with the COVID, uh, many of the hospitals scaled back their operations. Uh, some hospitals actually closed because of uh, lack of uh, access, but also human resources problem. But uh, our scheme has been able to continue and uh, get more private sector hospitals. And last three months, we have been able to get close to 3,000 hospitals uh, impaneled with us, uh, providing non-COVID care. And uh, the non critical non-COVID care has almost uh, not suffered during this because of uh, uh, this. Third thing is about data and uh, the importance of data and the kind of uh, the several uh, hundred terabyte of data that we have also helped in terms of identifying the high risk groups and people who have comorbidities because, uh, clearly from their records and getting in touch with them and providing them information, education uh, that has been uh, tremendous. But also uh, from our regular flow of uh, information on uh, uh, what is happening, where um, influenza-like illnesses are coming up, where sari-like illnesses are coming up, that can provide leading indicators or leading uh, help uh, for surveillance and seeing if uh, uh, the problems are emerging there. Fourth, uh, the IT structure, uh, the IT backbone that we've created helped also some states in monitoring not only PMJ COVID beneficiaries, uh, what, what is happening, but also non-PMJ COVID beneficiaries. Uh, many states uh, asked us to expand our IT framework to help them uh, monitor uh, what is happening uh, support for the COVID. And finally, uh, the call center that we created under the scheme has been able to provide an, uh, support for uh, 1075, which is the uh, lifeline for, for COVID uh, help. And uh, in last uh, few months, we have fielded close to 30 lakh calls and diverted integrated similar amount of calls to states. And so close to 60 lakh calls have been uh, fielded uh, through this. And this was also because of the uh, digital uh, call center that you had uh, uh, put in place and it helped. So in general, what we see is that initiatives like this can help build resilience against any unforeseen uh, uh, attacks or medical, uh, medical, uh, medical uh, emergencies. And uh, so, uh, so with that, uh, I, I uh, still feel that there are many areas, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, they need uh, um, uh, further, further support. And uh, using the opportunity which has been given to us by bringing the health sector to the core of uh, a policy discussion, we should be pushing on those areas. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bhushan. And thank you for your wonderful service and congratulations on all your awards. And uh, really, what a privilege to have you as leading this enormous initiative. Our next speaker is going to be uh, Ms. Preeti Sudhan, who's a, who's a friend and has been a collaborator for um, the last few years with us in the ECHO project in India. Um, she was the health secretary of India till last month, where she's been a key strategist in times of the COVID-19 pandemic, a 1983 batch IS officer of the Andhra Kader. She was previously secretary department of food and public distribution. She also served as special secretary, Ministry of Women and Child Development and as joint secretary in the Ministry of Defense. In her, in her career, she has a distinguished track record of serving in finance and planning, disaster management, tourism, and agriculture. Ms. Sudhan has been a very key functionary in the planning and implementation of the Ayushman Bharat Yojana. Um, welcome, uh, Ms. Preeti Sudhan. Um, and please tell us um, about, the about the critical bottlenecks and resource constraint in achieving universal health care in India. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Arora, and so good to see you again. And thank you. I begin with the, uh, many thanks for all the handholding that you've done for training our uh, um, resource persons during this COVID time. 
and uh, because we are talking about this let me say that we have trained about 7 million people uh, in this um, uh, during these tough times and this was very very critical so let me begin uh, with the topic itself uh, we are discussing today building resilience in india's primary health care system when we when i'm talking about opportunities and bottlenecks i think i would first like to begin with what will make us resilient because if we are very clear in that vision then we can identify our bottlenecks and also identify what our constraints are and how we can remove them so in my mind there are seven key elements that will build our resilience first is that we should have a very clear statement of deliverables we are talking about primary health care what are our target groups uh, what is the diversity that uh, india has you know tribal areas hilly areas difficult areas unaccessible areas then areas where you have specific diseases like um, you know um, we've been facing uh, um, uh, local epidemics also so very very clear statement of deliverables whether now we also need to move to um, you know the vertical uh, we need to merge the vertical programs horizontally uh, we have non communicable and uh, communicable uh, communicable program separately mch separately what's the platform so a very clear statement of deliverables number 1 secondly of course hr you see uh, the human resource element doctors nurses uh, lab technicians uh, epidemiologists and so on i just want to tell you that a lot of work has been done in india in this regard uh, uh, whether it is on medical uh, uh, you know uh, pg um, uh, education or you know increasing the seat in undergrad or post grad or specialist diploma courses now started by dnb so there has been lot that's a matter of a separate um, video conference but what i want to point out is that we have now started with uh, the health and wellness centers community uh, health providers that is the main thing because when you're talking about primary health care then community health providers and community medicine is one thing which needs to be worked on which is which will make us resilience it's being done in uh, in health in education also medical education and actually today we have uh, about uh, 44000 uh, community health providers in place in our health uh, in our uh, health and wellness centers which i'll talk in a minute second is that you know adequate training and uh, and regular updation of skills of these workers then fourth is motivation to perform both uh, monetary and non monetary you have seen our ashas this is performance based um, you see payments and a lot of prestige and respect they uh, have in their uh, villages so that 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 makes the difference you know you feel that you are a part of this social uh, enterprise then of course adequate adequate infrastructure equipment it's not about buildings only it's about how the services are also delivered then uh, uh, you have next is very close monitoring and feedback why i'm saying this is because you see the, the scenario is evolving so we need to keep learning and reinventing ourselves if we don't do that if we become stagnant then it it doesn't help next is of course social audit we must have social audit of our health services for health and wellness centers we have put in place that social audit will be done by the self help groups in the villages itself so accountability is very important and accountability has to be not by a big organization it has to be by people themselves so um, where are we now uh, as you know that uh, since pre independence actually we had this vision of a very robust primary health care system very comprehensive uh, and bore committee uh, did outline that national health policy of 2017 spoke about uh, you know accessible affordable quality uh, health care with uh, within a, a paradigm of ethics however we did not translate it into a program it has been done with ayushman bharat with two pillars one is uh, the uh, pmj and the second is the health and wellness centers and i'm so glad that we did it this way 
because then the entire paradigm of health care we have covered and now with covid we have seen how important it is to have a robust public health care system so uh, in our journey so far uh, it was mch you know mother and child services oriented uh, primary health care till now the vertical programs uh, dealing with communicable diseases with non communicable diseases non communicable diseases mind you was largely ignored you are part of our uh, tb uh, vertical program also and um, then uh, now with the health and wellness centers and pmj this is the first time that we are talking about comprehensive preventive promotive healthcare so i want to emphasize that india's primary healthcare system can become resilient only if the preventive and promotive aspects of healthcare are also integrated you spoke about usa usa spends 18% of its gdp on healthcare but just look what's happening during covid you don't have outreach workers you don't have anything to reach people to so that is what uh, i think uh, india has done right and we need to build on it so i again want to repeat that health is a public good we must recognize that health is an individual responsibility we don't uh, we've not you know sort of worked on that so um, and health is not just absence of disease it is wellness and i think the the prime minister's message which he gave in um, you know uh, in the health uh, in um, uh, the gen uh, general assembly of uh, united nations also last year very very clearly said that for us it is preventive and promotive healthcare it is wellness that we want to bring into healthcare so that is why i want to also emphasize that health ministry cannot do health alone so the ministry of uh, women and child ministry of panchayati raj rural development then you see uh, this um, swachh bharat abhiyan eat right movement fit india movement the gram swaraj abhiyan the way the multi sectoral you see a uh, field level and middle level and higher level uh, ministries have converged that is what we need uh, to build on that's what will make us resilient when i talk about these things i'd like to say how do we institutionalize it's very easy to speak about these things how do you translate it into actual reality for that i would like to say that there are few steps let me begin from the very um, uh, you know from the field level the thank you uh, you know please um, please end in about 30 seconds just because we want to give the other speakers okay some. okay so then you you should have warned me earlier you didn't give me the time in the beginning i think <laughs> okay so just to say that all the field workers together will work and we need uh, to leverage technology our e sanjeevani our uh, telemedicine your echo platform recognize good work we are have the, today digital uh, health mission has been announced by the prime minister from the red fort we'll take that forward so this is what uh, in my view will make primary healthcare resilient thank you well, thank you uh, secretary sudan and and um, happy independence day to all it's it's a pleasure to um, um, introduce our next speaker dr devi shetty is the chairman and founder of narayana health cardiac surgeon with 34 years of experience he is also the he is world renowned he is also the initiator of the micro health insurance scheme that led to deshasafni scheme world's cheapest comprehensive health insurance scheme set up by the government of karnataka which benefits millions of farmers in karnataka he is the recipient of a number of awards and honors most noteworthy being the padma shri and padma bhushan awards conferred by the government of india and the rajyotsava sapseva award conferred by the government of karnataka Uh, welcome dr devi shetty um, please talk to us about uh, the role of public private partnerships in resolving the bottlenecks in our health system thank you 5 minutes we have 6 minutes yeah yeah it's okay fine the uh, thank you so much thanks a lot for the opportunity uh, on the 6th of august that's few days ago government of india came up with a gazette notification which has essentially liberated higher medical education 
the impact is that this will the single step by our government will transform the way healthcare is delivered across the country and today we are our indicator of healthcare we are at 112 position below iran iraq venezuela i am very convinced in 5 years we will reach one of the top levels why this transformation will happen by single regulation it is because every year 170000 young doctors passionate doctors appear for post graduate examination entrance test out of them not more than 30 of 30000 of them get a, their post graduate seat of their choice and the remaining 110000 120000 doctors do not go back to work in a government or a private hospital instead they head directly towards kerala or kota to attend coaching classes to mug multiple choice questions for the next 2 to 4 years to 5 years with the belief that one day they will get that illusive pg seats which they never get because they don't exist but with the new liberation policy government has done the cleverest thing by introducing diploma courses which is a two year diploma course not the three year diploma course the advantage of that is if they introduce a three year course all the big hospitals government and private are already saturated with post graduate residents by introducing diploma courses few thousand government hospitals and private hospitals with 100 bed 200 beds can become post graduate institutions our biggest problem today we are in this mess because entire countries government hospitals have a shortage of 80% for medical specialties mm. i'll give an example women and children comprise 60% of the country's population they need a gynecologist there are only 30000 gynecologists in the country they need a pediatrician a country which produces 24 million babies a year has less than 30000 40000 pediatricians they need the support of a family physician we have a shortage they need radiologists to uh, do the imaging there are less than 10500 radiologists so government hospitals were virtually not contributing to the healthcare now with this training program happening there will be a transformation happening because of the young passionate doctors working in this government hospitals who will serve the patient and also become better doctors now we have been hearing a lot about covid problem affecting thousands of people large number of people getting admitted to icu and we heard so much of debate about ventilator everyone was talking about the ventilator but none of us talked about a person called anesthesiologist who is going to link the patient covid patient to the anesthesia machine and they are called anesthesiologist and there are less than 30000 40000 anesthetists in the whole country and half of them are more than 45 50 years old they are not comfortable in treating patients so with the uh, uh, launching of this course large number of private hospitals will be able to train huge number of doctors required similarly large number of government hospitals together they will create such a formidable force that about 1 lakh doctors who are not currently touching the patients will come back to touch the patients and serve the needs and this will have a huge transformative effect and the other huge transformative effect these courses of higher education are virtually free they don't need to pay any fees instead these doctors when they are working they get handsome stipend so they can manage with their family so this will encourage large number of children from poor families to join medical college and why we want children from deprived families to join medical college because these are the children children coming from poor families what we notice across the world doctors 
who have magic in their fingers generally come from deprived background and those children in indian context are not dreaming of becoming doctors because of the high cost with the liberating higher medical education there will be a transformative effect and i am convinced that india will become the first country in the world to dissociate healthcare from affluence within the next 5 to 7 years i have no doubt about it thank you very much for this opportunity uh, thank you well thank you dr devi shadi that was such an inspiring message you know i think that uh, you know in latin we have always focused on exports if we did what you said it would i've, I've enjoyed reading your article beds don't treat patients doctors do and um, I, i think it makes so much sense and liberating people uh, to do and follow their dreams um, you know it also helps us economically you know healthcare workers can be a major export as as i said we work in 158 countries everywhere there's a shortage and indian doctors are often considered the best doctors in every country that i go to so i think that if you do what you're saying it could have a huge impact i want to now open this up for discussion and i hope uh, preeti sudhan and um, dr indu boshan you can turn on your cameras too and we can have a discussion one very major challenge that is coming up in that we are seeing all over the world was just last week in the us we there we did a survey here and people were asked this question if a vaccine was available today for covid-19 would you take it and only 66% responded that they would actually take it the second issue for us is that 7 billion people will have to be vaccinated all at once after about 7 months between 7 months and a year a vaccine will be here it will be mass manufactured the question and most countries that i have been talking to don't have the trained healthcare workforce to motivate patients to tell them what the side effects are why they should take it for themselves how will it benefit their family how will they manage side effects i wanted to offer the uh, we are doing this in africa to all across 50 countries in africa but i also wanted to offer this platform to india for training the our echo platform for training of workforce and planning now for vaccine delivery that is about to come in india if you could also comment on this of how we should move forward in this area and also other things in relation to what you've heard from each other speakers let me go to dr indu bhushan first yeah i think um, uh, administering this vaccine to 1.3 billion people in the country will be a challenge it will be a challenge from logistics point of view it will be a challenge from how do you prioritize who should get get it first and uh, also uh, you rightly pointed out that we need to see uh, how to deliver it because uh, uh, if uh, we want to deliver only through the public sector uh, then that will be a challenge especially if you want to do it in a very short amount of time and uh, fortunately uh, government of india is fully aware of these challenges and there is a task force uh, right now uh, as we speak uh, established which uh, is looking into all these issues including uh, how the vaccines will be uh, stored uh, procured stored and delivered and uh, how they'll be the implementation be monitored and i have no doubt that this uh, task force is going to have a very effective plan of action uh, put in place well before the vaccine is available thank you and a question for you uh, ms preeti sudhan uh, you can comment on this too and also i think you're muted still um and and um, i wanted to certainly tell you that if you decide to use the platform we can help you train a million people uh, if if that was required in india um but the other question if you could also comment as we go from speaker to speaker dr shetty has given this idea for post graduation but what is the harm in also training us thinking that we are going to become the healthcare provider workforce for the world and and really expanding in all different areas of uh, of healthcare workforce we already are a nurse exporter and this is something college education uh, indians like to pursue 
Uh, is that an opportunity for us too, in the economic sense, uh, uh, Ms. Preeti Sudhan? Uh, just quickly on a vaccine, there is a, uh, there is a committee, a high-level committee, which has been formed with Dr. Paul and Secretary as co-chair. They are working out every nitty-gritty of uh, vaccine, um, uh, you see, once it comes, how distribution, storage, uh, transportation, and definitely, I think you should send an email to Secretary. I will also tell them that your platform should be used. I'm sure it will be used, Dr. Arora, because we are using it in our healthcare uh, training anyways, number one. Number two, on what Dr. Shetty said, so I'd also like to tell you that there is an Allied Health Professionals Bill, which is uh, which was actually to be introduced in the parliament, but uh, it uh, sort of, uh, because the parliament got uh, postponed uh, because of uh, COVID, therefore, this is a game changer. We will be, a, because we will regulate all health professionals across, um, you see, the spectrum of healthcare. It will really uh, give us, give a boost to, we will not only export, but we will also be able to have credibility. Today we see that nurses in US are from Philippines and all not from India because we don't have a very robust regulatory system, number one. Number two, uh, Dr. Shetty uh, actually has been in touch and I'm uh, glad that he has acknowledged what we have done uh, for DNB diplomas. Now everywhere mm -hmm. in the district, each district can actually ha have um, a, a diploma postgrad uh, student there which will he or she will not only contribute to healthcare, but also then work there in the long term. And um, there are a lot of things going on in healthcare. I think uh, we should have a separate, um, you know, uh, um, dialogue on that. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Dr. Devi Shetty, if you have additional comments, and I saw Mr. Mohandas Pai had, had also put his camera on. I don't know if you had a comment. First, you, Dr. Devi Shetty, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, the, the, the Sanjeev, the, today, uh, 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 IT products are one of the largest foreign currency earner in the range of, I think, about $150 billion, if I'm not mistaken. If we train 5 million doctors, nurses, medical technicians with the idea of them being prepared to get a job outside India and 5 million workforce can easily remit $100 billion a year, which is almost as big as the largest revenue generator IT industry. And this we have to do it. The reason is across the world, there will be shortage of nearly, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the more than 12 to 13 million healthcare workforce uh, in the near future. When that kind of a workforce shortage happens, what the first world countries will do is to open their doors. Then all our doctors and all our nurses will fly away in a very short period of time because there they get expo the exponentially higher salary than what we have. It's an existential threat for India not to look at the healthcare needs of the rest of the world. And we have to reorganize our training program so that they can easily pass those entrance exam and get the suitable job. And Dr. Devi Shetty, that's exactly the point I was trying to make to you is everywhere I go, there is a huge sucking sound from other places to, uh, uh, for healthcare workers. If we expand our nurse practitioner, physician assistant programs, uh, primary care doctor programs, specialty programs, we can do what we have done in IT. Uh, and exactly, uh, be, this could be the biggest export we can provide to the world. Uh, because mostly not because of the fact that it's an export thing. That's what Indians want to do. It's their talent. They enjoy it. Indian doctors and nurses are recognized all over the world. And it, it, is, it offers an amazing opportunity for us to lead the world and provide service in that area. Let's, I, I think we have about six minutes more left in this panel. Uh, Santosh, are there questions from the audience that we should be taking or should we continue our discussion for the six minutes? If you could just uh, chat us and tell us what the answer is. But um, Dr. Indu Boshan, do you have any comments about what um, Dr. Devi Shetty said just now?
uh, I think uh, uh, this is the issue also, uh, Ms. Preeti Sudan also um, uh, touched upon, uh, uh, issue of uh, human resources and uh, ensuring that uh, we have uh, human resources at different level uh, available for our own country, but also uh, for the whole world. I think, uh, uh, again, uh, I have a strong conviction that government of India, I think, is on the right track on uh, uh, providing uh, the, uh, these human resources and developing these human resources through a yeah. uh, lot of uh, initiatives and policies which have been put in place in the last few years. So I think we'll see some results uh, in, in coming years. And I think I, I'm very hopeful that uh, we are on the right track in this direction, uh, Dr. Arora. Thank you. And um, Dr. Su um, I'm Preeti Sudhan, how do, you, how do we incentivize our doctors in rural areas um, that have no, uh, to work in rural areas? Because currently there's no access to quality medical care. Somebody of our audience asks this question. Could you just talk a little bit about that? Two things I, uh, come to my mind immediately. First is that under the NHM, we have a policy of you quote I pay. So we ask the uh, doctor to actually quote, and we are paying in rural areas of Bastar and uh, you know, even in Northeast, almost uh, um, two to three, three lakhs per month. We ask them to quote, number one. Number two, recently, uh, MCI and Government of India have notified compulsory district internship for our postgrad students. So this will come into force from next year, uh, from the, this coming year. Uh, uh, so that also will ensure that, um, you know, there is an incentive there. Next is for the community health provider uh, in the rural areas, we are, uh, it is again, 20% uh, uh, is, um, is the monthly salary that is uh, given. Next is performance base. And thirdly, under the NMC bill, as you said, the, the nurse practitioner will be given uh, powers to actually practice community medicine. So these are some of the things that come to my mind. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Shetty, just one, uh, uh, could you just address this question a little bit about rural. In some countries, what they do is, because lots of people want to become doctors, if the government has medical schools where people can go and get a, a medical school education at low cost, why could they not also have an associated rural uh, sort of commitment to go to a rural area for a certain period of time? This is a uniform practice in many countries in the world. Is that a possibility for us to encourage people and sort of have a quid pro quo? And uh, uh, this will be the last question after which we'll just do wrap up, please. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah Sanjeev, the, uh, we have uh, about uh, 500 medical colleges and they have a massive campus, which is perhaps the largest campuses. I don't think many countries in the world have this big campuses and the infrastructure. Okay. And they are allowed to take about 100 to 150 students per year. Now, we have about 700 district hospitals. Now, these district hospital should become part of the medical colleges. Each medical college should be asked to double the number of seats the preclinical training happens in the campus. Clinical work, they go to the uh, district hospital. And this is where they get trained. So straight away from 60 or 70,000 undergraduation seats in the country, you have doubled the number of undergraduation seats at virtually no cost to the government. And once you convert a district hospital as a medical college, nursing college, paramedical college, entire concept of delivering healthcare in the district will change. The students do not, doctors don't go to remote locations for the sake of money. They go there for the training. I did my first job in Leeds uh, in, in TB sanatorium because of the degree and the training they will give. Thank you. No, I think, I, first of all, I want to really, honor, uh, so honored to have this a chance to moderate this panel. Thank you all for, for coming. I want to wrap up by saying some of the key conclusions that we've had. The first is, it is necessary for us to expand our healthcare workforce at all levels. This can serve our communities in India, 
It can prevent an exodus, which will necessarily occur if we don't do that expansion. Second, expansion of the specialty workforce and the nurse practitioner program that uh, uh, Preeti talked about and you talked about. I think this is an amazing thing, which will help us a lot. I think we need to, as you said, prepare much more for vaccine delivery and make sure that the workforce is there so we can stop this epidemic cold at, this, at that point when the vaccine is there in India. Our performance has not been quite as good as many countries in the world. And um, as far as ECHO is concerned, uh, we are willing to offer our platform at no charge to anyone in India who wants to use it um, for the benefit of the people of India. And so thank you all again. And uh, thank you to the organizers for giving me an opportunity to be a part of it. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Arora, uh, Dr. Shetty, Ms. Sudan, and uh, Dr. Bhushan. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and for your uh, incisive and timely insights. Thank you.